Undoubtedly by now, you've heard about the upcoming debate between prominent young Earth creationist Ken Ham and Bill Nye the Science Guy. It's scheduled to be held on February 4th, 2014 at the Creation Museum in Kentucky. The topic will be, Is Creation a Valid Model for Origins? Bill Nye, of course, has been very vocal about his opposition to teaching creationism to children, which led to a series of YouTube responses by a number of people associated with Ken Ham's Answers in Genesis. A question has arisen among a number of people in the atheist and secular humanist communities about whether it is a good thing for Bill Nye to legitimize the young earth creationist position by engaging it. I mean, there's very good evidence to suggest that the revenue generated by this publicity will go directly to Answers in Genesis's Creation Museum and possibly even to the Noah's Ark amusement park that the ministry is trying to build. As a former fundamentalist Christian who abandoned my beliefs in part because of logical problems I had with the literal Genesis, I think that there is merit in, to engaging and publicly debunking popular creationist arguments. That being said, I'm a little bit concerned about Bill Nye's approach to this debate. I'm concerned about Bill Nye walking into a trap during this discussion in which his audience will most likely be composed of fundamentalist Christians with a few representatives from the skeptic community who I understand will not be allowed to record the events. That's very suspicious to me. I worry that Bill Nye will come in with his well-prepared notes and his peer-reviewed studies and his mountains of empirical evidence and he'll still lose the debate because he fails to understand the rhetorical and semantic trickery of Christian apologetics, particularly young earth creationist apologetics, as well as the presuppositional position that is at its core part of biblical creationism's foundation. Answers in Genesis, the Institute for Creation Research, and other similar organizations outright state in their literature and on their websites that they will deny or spin any evidence that contradicts their reading of the Bible. They believe these things not because of evidence, not because of reason, but primarily because this is what their holy book says. Dr. Kurt Wise is a respected figure in creationist circles with impressive credentials even by secular standards. A stupid man he is not, but yet he embodies this more than anyone. Dr. Wise tells the story of confronting the evidence revolution in an old earth as a young student, and then realizing that if these things were true, he would have to rip out entire passages and pages of the Bible. And with the mindset that any person raised in fundamentalist Christianity can identify with, he refused to do that. He infamously said this, I quote, Although there are scientific reasons for accepting a young earth, I am a young age creationist because that is my understanding of the scripture. As I shared with my professors years ago when I was in college, if all the evidence in the universe turns against creationism, I would be the first to admit it. But I would still be a creationist because that is what the word of God seems to indicate. Honestly, I'm not sure that Bill Nye is ready to adopt the mindset that is needed to attack this kind of young earth creationist position. In an argument where your opponent claims that, for example, Tyrannosauruses were all vegetarian plant eaters and only started eating meat when an evil talking snake tricked a rib woman into eating magic fruit, uh, you can't just appeal to evidence. You have to kind of undermine the presupposition that goes with the statement, namely that this position is held not because there's a particular sound reason to hold it, but because somehow this person seems to need to reconcile their deeply held religious conviction with a mountain of contrary scientific evidence. Advocates for young earth creationism often like to present themselves to school boards and politicians as scientific underdogs with a well-supported but unpopular theory about origins and geology, on equal footing with people who claim that evolution is true. They like to present themselves as open to debate because we need to teach the controversy, quote unquote. Nothing could be further from the truth. You see, when I open up the Journal of Nature, or even the less academic Scientific American or National Geographic, I don't see a statement reinforcing the idea that Darwin's origin of species or descent of man are inerrant and that all evidence that might challenge those books need to be reinterpreted or dismissed. That is not the case with so-called creation science journals, which have statements of faith or belief in which the inerrancy of the Bible, including a literal genesis, can't be called into question. In other words, reality itself has to be made to line up with the most literal reading of Genesis, rather than the other way around, of somebody interpreting beliefs or creating beliefs based on reality. I mean, the, is there any particular reason to believe that a family of eight led by an over 600-year-old man, can maintain a floating zoo and during a global cataclysm? No, not particularly, unless you happen to have a deeply held need for such a story to be true. 
This is why creationist pseudoscientific explanations for diversity like baromenology continue to be pushed forward by creationists. For how else can you even attempt to explain, however badly, the fact that Noah's family would have had to care for millions of animals on the ark, or the obvious fact that separate species like, say, lions and tigers or horses and zebras can interbreed? Bill Nye will hopefully attack this point, but again, I don't know if he understands what he is truly in for in the way that we former fundamentalist Christians do. And let us not assume that creationist apologetics is above circumnavigating physical evidence and appealing directly to cheap shock tricks. For example, it is entirely possible that Ken Ham will pull a popular and underhanded creationist trick of claiming that evolution is racist. When I was still a believer and in the habit of reading creationist magazines and literature in our Christian schools library, I remember vividly reading about the evolutionary worldview, quote unquote, and that it was the foundation of violent racism. Of course, I, know, I now know that the theory of evolution doesn't make value judgments about differences within and between species, but only explains them. The great irony, of course, is that one of the most racist arguments to ever be put forth in defense of racism actually comes from people who read Genesis literally. For in Genesis chapter 9, we continue the story of Noah and learn that after getting really, really drunk and hungover one day, he collapsed naked, and one of his sons, Ham, uncovered his nakedness. When righteous Noah sobered up, he then, according to tradition, cursed Ham's son Canaan and his other descendants into servitude to his brother. To this day, most biblical literalists, include, including Answers in Genesis, believe that Ham was the ancestor of all dark-skinned Africans, and it is not unheard of for, to hear fundamentalists claim that the curse of Ham is the reason why Africans have endured such hardship, including the transatlantic slave trade. Many, especially before and during the 19th century, argue that the empowering of this curse meant that it was God's will that we dark-skinned people be subservient to lighter-skinned people. While most creationists would not openly admit to holding these views, these ideas regarding the inferiority of Ham's African descendants are not unheard of, again, among very prominent creationist advocates. Most prominent, perhaps, was Henry Morris, who founded the Creation Research Institute and the Creation Research Journal, and in many ways is the father of modern young earth creationism. He once wrote that Hemetic people had a particular acumen for servitude, and basically implied that the crudeness of their culture was inevitably supplanted by the more sophisticated descendants of Noah's other sons, Japheth and Shem, who Noah blessed. Hopefully Ken Ham is not foolish enough to pull the racism card in this debate, and if he is, I hope Nye uh, has a thoughtful answer for it, because it is one of the most underhanded tricks that creationists will employ. It's possible, of course, that Ham will attempt to keep the debate from drifting into the more outlandish creationist claims like vegetarian sharks, plant life surviving global flood, or inbreeding among the descendants of the animals on Noah's Ark, leading to the great diversity of land animals we see today. He might try focusing on a general and not specific design and nature argument that points to a designer, Yahweh, of course, not any of the other multiple creator deities from various world mythologies. That would just be silly, but I doubt it. What ultimately needs to be established by Nye is the fact that human beings have been on a journey, path if you will, that has routinely made supernatural explana explanations for things less and less necessary, or even credible as scientific understanding has advanced. One of the best episodes of his 1990s program, in my opinion, was about skepticism of pseudoscientific claims and demanding that extraordinary claims meet the requirement of having extraordinary evidence backing them up. In retrospect, I appreciate that episode now even more than I did when I was in junior high. Awesome episode. Famous skeptic James Randi even made a cameo in it. Check it out if you can. For a long time, the campy music video from that episode was the video that played on this very channel's page. The lyric stated, When people make claims that may not be true, there are so many tests that you must do. 100% pure proof. In other words, answer the questions by questioning the answers. Take care, everyone, and good luck, science guy.